Today's guest is Dr. Richard Hovanisian. I wondered whether I should make an introduction for Dr. Hovanisian because I'm not sure how much of an introduction he needs, but I will leave you with this. I think that by the end of this podcast episode, you'll have gained knowledge, you'll have gained wisdom, and you'll have gained humbleness. This is the Armenian Harvest. Hi, Dr. Hovanisian. Um, thank you for coming on to the podcast. Uh, Dr. Hovanisian, the first question I wanted to ask was, can you tell the story of how you met Simon Veratian and your relationship and how he gave you a blessing to oh. do your work? Well, Simon Veratian, as you know, was the last prime minister of the first Armenian Republic, not for very long, actually, for probably just about a week or so in order to hand over what was left of the Armenian Republic to Soviet rule. And um, he was um, a fiery journalist in his younger days. He was born in, near uh, Nordnachchevan in Medsala in the north and um, then became an active member of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, ultimately took on various positions in um, the Armenian government before he became the last prime minister. And then, like many others of the Armenian Republic, after the February uprising, anti-Soviet uprising, uh, they fled or, or they left for Tabriz in Iran. And from there, they scattered to Tehran, Beirut, and other places. Uh, he, he went to Beirut along with a number of other Eastern Armenian speakers. And <clears throat> then in the 1950s, um, they had created already what was known as the Palanjan Jemaran. This was an academy uh, unusual in that it was not a religious style academy, secular, um, with um, people who had been active in the Armenian Republic. And then in uh, the early 50s, when the principal, um, Levon Shant, a well known writer, uh, died, he was called upon to become the principal of the Nisham Palanjan Jemaran. And that's where we intersected because in his first year uh, as principal, he came to San Francisco. I was at Berkeley. He came to San Francisco uh, for money raising and fundraising and also um, interacting with the community. And I, I first met him there. I was impressed with him and he apparently <laughs> was sufficiently impressed with me. Uh, and um, he knew that my interest in Armenian things, he also knew that I didn't read or write Armenian and uh, suggested that I <clears throat> leave my studies and go to Beirut uh, to his school and learn the language. And so when I graduated from Berkeley, first with a BA and then a general secondary teaching degree, instead of going into teaching immediately, I took a year off and um, took a ship to Beirut and lived a marvelous nine months in Beirut, um, which changed my life, and where he was sort of my godfather uh, during that period, and where I learned a lot from him, asked him a lot of questions, not enough questions, because at that time I didn't know enough to ask. Mm -hmm. And what were you aspiring to be whenever you had that relationship with him? Well, I, I knew always that I wanted to be a teacher. And um, Armenian was always interesting to me, but Armenian was not a field. There was no course in Armenian studies anywhere in the United States. One didn't do that. Um, and uh, so I wanted to go into our Armenian field. I didn't know how to go into it, but I felt the need uh, to do that. And also, I was an idealist, um, a young idealist who dreamed about an independent Armenia. I remember my first trip to New York City and uh, United Nations Plaza, 
where there was no army and a flag. And, you know, as a young idealist dreaming that wouldn't be wonderful to be Armenia's representative to the United mm -hmm. Nations, little knowing mm -hmm. that half a generation later, my son would actually raise the Armenian flag. Uh, and I was fortunate to be uh, present. So um, when I went to Beirut, it was able to be able to read and write the language and maybe use it for an MA degree, which I did when I came back to the United States and went back to Berkeley. I uh, did an MA degree there in the field of, um, I, there was no army in the field, but I did it in Russian history. And I wrote a thesis on the Sovietization of the First Armenian Republic. And then I was just fortunate because um, when I came to Fresno to teach in the city schools, just Armenian studies were just beginning. And I met the right people at the right time uh, to invite me to UCLA to inaugurate um, courses in Armenian language and uh, history. And uh, that sort of changed my life. I came to Los Angeles in the early 1960s, and I taught at UCLA until 2011. So it was a very rich uh, experience, very fortuitous. And I, right. and I guess I've been called a pioneer in Armenian studies because I became a professor of Armenian studies and history without ever having taken a course in Armenian mm -hmm. history that didn't exist. So self-taught, right. and then I had my own PhD students, and they did have um, the good or bad fortune of having a director. Uh, Dr. Hovannisian, since there were so little sources at the time when you were beginning on Armenia, I think you mentioned that there was like less than 10 um, when you were just beginning. How did you f navigate to finding reliable sources on our Armenian history? Yeah. Well, that was always a, a major issue because reliable is a loaded word. Uh, our community, you know, many people who came to the United States, families after the 1960s and so forth, um, have really no sense of the Armenian American community. They really don't know its history its dynamics. Um, you know, I was the child of a genocide survivor born um, in the United States as a um, first-generation American born. And our life was very different uh, from anyone probably could imagine now. Extreme poverty, uh, uh, people trying to get back on their feet, uh, buying vineyards uh, on uh, with, with loans and up. Uh, if they couldn't pay them off, then the bank came and took it back, and many of those people came to Los Angeles. My father made it through the Great Depression. I lived, We had a 17-acre farm on which I grew up, but it was also an enormously splintered community. Um, we didn't know what hunchucks were, but we knew what rangavars and tashmaks were. And our communities were divided viciously and violently against each other on a number of, I suppose, bases. Number one is, if you fail, then you blame, people blame you and you blame yourself. And the First Republic had failed. It didn't continue, and so you had to blame someone. Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, the question of Soviet Armenia. Well, uh, people like the Ramgawars and the Ramgawar party, which is a liberal party, it's not a Soviet party at all, or a socialist party, believe that Soviet Armenia was the best possible um, that existed and that we should support it uh, and close our eyes to any faults there. Uh, and also to um, denigrate any of them who didn't like Soviet Armenia and who took an active part against it. And so our community was very split, and even blood was spilled uh, within mm -hmm. our community. So if you didn't, weren't in America before the mm -hmm. 1960s, these don't 
make much sense to you. But it was in, enormously um, demited, and only after World War II uh, did we begin to draw back together, uh, understanding that we had common interests and uh, seeing also dangers to the community. Uh, our gen parents' generation would see intermarriage, for example, as a danger and something to be try to avoid. Um, so. Um, this is a really interesting point because this that polarization that you're talking about, I'm seeing it here uh, right now with what's everything that's happening. Is there a perspective, a specific perspective that you could talk about that might help us to better understand um, how to go about polarization and what can bring Armenians together uh, to be less polarized? Well, success. Um, to the degree that um, Artsakh Karabakh had been liberated and developed even there, and there were, of course, resentment by some people that the Karabakhs have taken over Armenia and so forth. But that aside, mm -hmm. there, there was a sense of pride. And uh, mm -hmm. I've written a number of articles saying that for, for Armenians, it was a, the wheel of history had turned because in the last hundred years, they had only lost and lost and lost genocide and displacement and having to pack their bags and go to another country. And the Karabakh question gave to the Armenians an empowerment that they had not known. And we saw it crushing, crushed before our eyes, crushed before our eyes. And again, mm -hmm. it's not unusual that we have to find or a scapegoat or blame someone, mm -hmm. um, even, if, even though we are a part of the blame. Uh, but it's easier to point a finger, I suppose. So we, we need to have success in some way. Uh, it could mm -hmm. be economic success. Um, and there are potentials. Uh, when I see um, your generation of young scientists and what they're able to do, it's, you know, it's awesome. And if they're able to apply that, to a development of Armenia and to make Armenia a um, something more than just a geopolitical place that can be sacrificed to the huge interests of major powers with millions and millions of people. Um, if you could make a niche where uh, you feel that or what is felt by others that what you have to offer is essential to them, important to them, then, then we might uh, move in that direction. Okay. Um, I want to go back to Artsakh. Um, I know the entire conflict made you write 200 pages about it, but um, how did the dynamics, like what was happening with Artsakh during the First Republic, and how did those mm -hmm. dynamics set the foundation for potential conflict um, later on. Yeah, it was a um, subject of conflict from the very beginning, even before the Republic, uh, because of its mm -hmm. mixed population, uh, because of its strategic value um, from the Armenian point of view and from the Azeri point of view. The, we called them Tatars at that time. They were the herdsmen. Mm -hmm. And in the summer, they would bring all their flocks up to Karabakh for summer pasture. And the people of Karabakh, mm -hmm. the Armenians, were farmers. And so they had the economic conflict of sheep uh, versus um, uh, you know, stationary crops. And there was a lot of conflict of, about that. In 1905, 1907, there were actually uh, armed clashes in, uh, in Karabakh between the uh, between the sides. And then in 1918, when independence was declared, it became all the more contentious because it was really very difficult 
to get to Artsakh from Yerevan. Um, if you look on a map, Artsakh is much closer to Yerevan than Baku. But factually, mm -hmm. it was much easier to get to Karabakh from Baku through the plains, the Muhan plains, and a railway that they had to Tiflis, uh, and getting off at Yevlak. And, and so they had a, an advantage immediately, whereas for the Armenians, they had to go on dirt roads and snow-covered uh, passages through Zangizur uh, in order to get there. And that would take several days. And even if they had the means to do that, it was really a challenge because from the very outset, the Armenian Republic was uh, bombarded or, or, or affected by continuous Muslim uprisings in the province of Yerevan. Everything south of Yerevan and the Yerevan railway station was primarily Muslim controlled. So for Armenia, it was very difficult to become active in Karabakh, although they did their best. They and the Karabakh people themselves actually uh, did what they could to prevent Azerbaijani rule. And they had uh, in, Az in uh, Karabakh uh, a number of uh, conferences uh, mm. to uh, assert their determination to be independent of Baku, and regard themselves a part of the Armenian Republic. The difficulty was that yeah. Armenia could not afford them uh, the necessary uh, economic and military uh, assistance that was required. Nonetheless, they held out. They held out. Uh, one of the negative sides of it was that the British, who occupied the Caucasus after the Turkish armies withdrew in 1918, acknowledged that Karabakh could be temporarily uh, under Azerbaijani jurisdiction, under a local governor whose name was Sultanov, a Kurd. And so uh, the Armenians of Karabakh struggled against that all the way. As a matter of fact, the British also recognized the temporary jurisdiction of Baku over Zangizur. And if the people of Zangizur had not dug in their heels and prevented uh, the uh, approach of the Azerbaijani armies from Karabakh, that area too would have been in uh, imminent danger. But uh, fortunately, uh, their leaders, including uh, Nijde and Dro and others were able to hold out there. So the bases for the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan over Karabakh uh, did not change much. That is, demographically, it was Armenian. Uh, economically, it was in more easily connected to Baku. And um, so yes. we had this struggle and rivalry. Uh, Soviet rule for 70 years simply put a lid on the conflict. And they gave um, Karabakh you know, a degree of autonomy, it was an autonomous region. Uh, there was a newspaper uh, Soviet Agan Karabakh, which was uh, in Armenian. Uh, so th there were um, concessions uh, made to the people mm -hmm. of Karabakh, and yet um, they didn't recognize it as belonging to Armenia, even though when Armenia first became a Soviet republic in 1920-21, the leader of Karabakh, mm -hmm. of, uh, of Azerbaijan, uh, whose name was Nariman Narimanov, made a very historic speech in which he said, look, now we're both Soviet republics, because Azerbaijan had become Soviet already. We don't need 
Karabakh. We don't need Zengizu. We don't need Nakhichevan. Armenia, you can take these areas and make it a part of your Soviet uh, uh, Armenia as a part of brotherhood. But that decision didn't last long. It was very quickly reversed, uh, largely because of the Baku communists who were very strong and influential in Moscow, and that includes some mm -hmm. Armenians who were also uh, arguing against uh, giving these areas to Armenia. So that that issue festered for 70 years until the 1980s, mm -hmm. even before the 1980s. Mm -hmm. When I went to Beirut, I don't think many people know this, in 1955, the ARF newspaper is Astag in Beirut, and they had headlines on April 1st, 1955, Karabakh given to Armenia. Oh, it was such an uh, emotional thing, only to realize the ugliness of it. It was an April Fool's joke. You know, April 1 is when you make, you, you trick people, right? And it was just a, mm -hmm. like a trick, which meant that the issue was nonetheless alive in Armenian minds. And then, of course, in the mm -hmm. 1980s, combined with everything else, and I remember very well my involvement in it, in all the activities around the world uh, in the Gorbachev years, when there seemed to be hope that Karabakh would, would be awarded to Armenia because Gorbachev himself said it was time to rectify past wrongs and implied that Stalin had been wrong in tolerating the giving of Karabakh to um, Azerbaijan. And a number of individuals mm -hmm. like Zori Balayan, uh, uh, and there was, a, I'm trying to remember, uh, Gorbachev's main economic uh, advisor, Arabek, I don't know if it was Arabekian or something, but it'll come back. They also made comments. I mean, when you're talking from the top of the Kremlin about time to make rectifications, that, of course, gives people a great deal of hope. And I understand that Gorbachev was really, really angry when he had to cut short his trip to New York City during the Noe Imperion or the, uh, the, the earthquake, uh, Gumri earthquake. And when he got to Gumri and they lifted up the concrete, um, the first thing that he was asked was, Karabakh uh, Devetsin, did they give us Karabakh instead of, you know, saying uh, uh, what a terrible circumstances we're in or thank you for coming? Instead, they're asking Gorbachev, did you give us Karabakh? Uh, showing how deep, uh, how deep the sentiment was. And the, the victory in Karabakh, um, in the 19, early 1990s, as I say, seemed to give Armenians the confidence that they had begun to turn the wheel of history. Their shortcoming of every administration. After that, was that it failed to persuade the international community that the future of Karabakh should not be regarded as anything different than the future of Kosovo, South Sudan, East Timur, mm -hmm. and from the Russian perspective, mm -hmm. even, you know, uh, uh, Abkhazia and Ossetia, because uh, the Russians recognized those areas, but never recognized Armenia. And so Armenian diplomacy uh, failed in 30 years to gain that acknowledgement and also to build up Shushi and Karabakh into strong bastions. I, 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 I find it very difficult even to listen to what's going on in Shushi now, the building, the construction, the changing the entire face of Shushi. Uh, 
and the world is silent and we're silent uh, in the face of what's going on. And today or tomorrow, we're not going to be surprised if there's a corridor from Turkey directly to Shushi. Uh, you know, it's all scary. It's all scary. And there's a lot of blame to be passed around, not one individual. But the lack of clever, manipulative, if you will, uh, Armenian leadership uh, mm. came to crush us uh, less than two years ago. Um, uh, Dr. Hovindson, I want to circle back. Um, you said something really interesting. There were Baku Armenians who were against uh, Sunik and Artsakh being part of Armenia. Could you elaborate on that? Why Why were they against it? Well, because they were um, very bitter young communists who had tried to overthrow the Armenian government in May of 1920. Mm -hmm like obvious Nurijanyan and others, they had to flee to Baku, and they were unrelenting in their opposition to the ARF and to the government that had been controlled by the ARF. And um, mm -hmm. some of them made, I mean, remember that Baku also had a huge Armenian population. Um, the Armenian population of Baku was probably greater than that of the Armenian population of Yerevan at the time. Uh, so there were natural connections. It was economic and other connections with Moscow. Uh, so I'm not saying there were many of them. Um, even the role of uh, Anastas Mikoyan, whom Armenians regard as a national hero, or most Armenians, even his role is questionable, just as it is in the purges that went on um, under Stalin. Um, why has it been so difficult for Armenians to get the international community's attention in this issue? Because I think even during the Paris Peace Conferences in the late, in the early 1920, 1918 to 1920, if I'm not mistaken, um, we didn't get invited to speak speak there, if, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? They didn't do what? No, the Armenian delegation was not able to speak um, or did not have a chair at the Paris Peace Conference. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, well, they were excluded. Armenia was excluded from the Paris Peace Conference on the grounds that it had not been an organized state during World War I mm -hmm. and that its case would be heard and if warranted, they would be admitted to the uh, Paris Peace Conference. A part of the problem was also the Russian question, because at the very same time that Armenia was seeking international recognition and assistance, the Russian Civil War was going on. And the major powers, primarily Great Britain and France, supported the white armies, uh, Denikin and uh, Kolchak uh, against um, uh, against the communists, and uh, to recognize the states that had been a part of the Russian Empire as independent would have been a insult to the Russian imperialists, and so they trotted very lightly on that question until the White Armies were mm -hmm. defeated. And only after they were defeated in 1920 did the Western powers recognize Ar the independence of the republics of Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. So there's a lot of politics involved, just as today. Um, mm. One can criticize Turkey all they want, but we've just seen, you know, a major coup for Turkey that who blocked the way. Of uh, Finland and Sweden until into NATO until it got what it wanted from them, and then on top of that, our President Biden said, "Oh, thank you very much. We're so appreciative to you." Uh, so you know, it's a big power. It's an important um, 
a lie militarily, economically, uh, politically, and mm-hmm. Armenia is none of those things. And mm-hmm. our emphasis on sort of you owe it to us because, you know, stupidly we say we're the first Christian nation or, uh, you know, whatever, whatever. Well, that's not how politics works, not at all. Um, I also wanted to uh, elaborate on Woodrow Wilson's role in um, in the um, in the whenever he was championing for Armenia's rights. Where was his fault, and what it, uh, could Wilson? Armenia have done anything different? Yeah. Did you say Will, uh, Wilson? You can write books on Wilson. Um, he was a complex character. He was sincerely pro-Armenian. He truly wanted to help Armenians, but his actions did not help Armenians. For example, right after World War I, if he had put the question of the United States assuming a protectorate called a mandate for Armenia, it's very likely that there was enough pro-Armenian sentiment still active in the Senate that it would have accepted it or accepted it in some way. Instead, mm-hmm. he insisted that the mandate question not be put before the Senate until such time as the treaty with Germany had been signed. And in that treaty mm-hmm. was the covenant of the League of Nations, charter of the League of Nations, under which one mandates could be awarded to another uh, an advanced country to look after the less advanced countries. This delay made a major um, difference because by that time he alienated the Congress so much that they didn't even uh, ratify the German treaty or the League of Nations. And the, Le- the Congress was controlled by Republicans, and he's a Democrat that doesn't have the brains, or not the brains, the wisdom to involve the Republicans in his top policy decisions and thinks that he can just ramrod it down their throats. Uh, And so he was not helpful. He was, you know, again, one has to qualify it. Helpful in getting grain uh, to Armenia, to getting Armenia out of famine, because uh, there are hundreds of thousands of Western Armenian refugees in uh, Armenia who are mm-hmm. starving to death. And so American grain in the spring of 1919 and summer of 1919 uh, saved, brought, brought the famine to an end. But politically, it just became worse and worse. And even in May of 1920, when he knew that the Senate would not ratify or accept a proposal to take a protectorate for Armenia, he insisted on putting that proposal before the Senate in order for him to say, look, I did what I could do, instead of maybe finding another way uh, as the Armenian National Committee at the time suggested. You no, know, okay, let's not take the mandate, but let's give Armenia arms, uh, military advisors, uh, provisions, other ways to help Armenia uh, struggle uh, successfully for its survival. He did none of these things. And so he's a very mixed character. You know, many Armenian homes have a map of United Armenia with Woodrow Wilson pointing the finger to Western Armenia. Well, that's, you know, romantic and wonderful. And probably in his heart, that's what he may have wanted. But his actions did nothing to reach that point. And I would be challenged, of course, by others who would have a much more sympathetic view of Woodrow Wilson. Right. <laughs>
Um, Dr. Alvinson, from a historical perspective, what role has Armenia played in the larger scheme of things? Not much. Uh, historically, yes. Uh, historically, they were never dominant. I mean, if, you know, Armenians like to point to the fact that they had an emperor for a few years known as Dikramets. But uh, normally, Armenians, um, th their skill, the skill of the Armenians for hundreds of years, because they were a small people and could not win militarily, was to mm -hmm. keep a balance of power between East and West. Armenia was stuck between the Eastern empires and the Western empires. And so it had to do its best to find a way to keep a balance. And sometimes it looked like treachery because if they were in a lie with Persia this year, two years down, they could be in a lie with the Romans. And of course, not trusted by anyone, but that was a that was a secret of their uh, survival. And we also know that intellectually and otherwise, they were contributors to world civilization. But you know, as a political force, a dominant political force, that they were not, and they had to adapt as best they could to the circumstances, and they adapted as best they could to several hundred years of Islamic rule uh, and uh, managed to survive. Survival was the name of the game. Uh, and that in itself is significant. For example, the Greek population of Asia Minor, after the Turks took over the Byzantine Empire, the Greek 95% of the Greek population Islamicized. They became Muslims. Um, they just couldn't take the pressures. It just become easier. There are many advantages to be a, the dominant religion. Uh, and yet most Armenians maintain their faith through their, uh, through their system of local governance and religious governance, which, interestingly enough, continued over to the Armenian communities of Beirut after uh, World War I, where the internal... <coughs> Community structures were based on religious affiliation. And so if the Armenians today still have, even though they weakened in, in Lebanon, if they have representation in the Armenian, in the Lebanese parliament, it's because of that structure based on a communal religious basis that assigns X number of seats uh, to the apostolic community, to the Catholic community, and so forth. Um, I wanted to turn to more of a philosophical question. Um, I think um, there's a prevalent victim mentality in Armenians. Um, how do you what what do you think we could do to get away from the victim mentality and not to just get away, but to also focus on our um, magnificent culture, music, mm -hmm. art, dance, literature, etc.? Well, you know, it's, it's very difficult. So long as we've been removed, excluded, driven from 90% of our lands, historic lands, and so long as the perpetrator side does nothing in repairing that, and so long as the world closes its eyes uh, to that except for passing non-binding resolutions that don't bring anything back. Uh, the victim mentality is going to be there, and also it's going to be exploited because some of our groups use um, the genocide as the basis of the common denominator for all Armenians. But earlier I mentioned mm -hmm. that Two things, you know, if, if the Karabakh conflict had resolved, been resolved in a favorable way in which Karabakh and Armenia were either united or almost united and developed. And secondly, if we can develop this young talent, intellectual talent, 
um, which is not bound by victimization, but by creativity, who knows the, how to use the technological world, who can go to Silicon Valley in California and compete with the best. <clears throat> Those give us a bit of hope. But based on our numbers, we also have to accept the reality that we are insignificant. Uh, and even uh, so painful for me is that even what we had has been diminished. You know, I was in my younger years, I would read um, a weekly paper by the Committee for cultural relations with Armenians abroad. And I think it was called Heide Naked Sign. And it was exciting to read that in the last month, how many Armenians had repatriated to Armenia from Argentina, from France, from the United States, from Lebanon, from Iran, uh, you know, and it, oh, you had a sense that we're in-gathering, in-gathering to a point where we were 3 million plus. And then 1990s came, and, and we lost half that population. Imagine the United States losing half of its population in a decade, or a little longer than a decade. It's un unfathomable. The loss of income, the loss of manpower, the loss of uh, military power, uh, all of these things. And again, I understand that it's not for me to seriously criticize because those students that came to my classes in UCLA from families that had left our Armenia were outstanding. Brilliant young students who probably could not have made it the same way if they had remained. So, you know, it's a conundrum. It's a, it's a dilemma. And I have to deal with that dilemma continuously. And I, you know, when I go to um, certain areas in the San Fernando Valley and the Glendale area, I shudder because I hear high Estancia Armenian everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And it's only giving me a sense of, that's just a little taste, how many have left. You know, I don't want to use the word abandoned. Uh, and who am I to blame? I'm living here. I was born here. And yet I do blame. And hope that that process needs to be reversed by economic development. And if there was a way for all people to live comfortably, they would choose Armenia over any other place where they would go because that's their country. But they were deprived of that yeah. possibility. Right. Yeah, it's, um, it is a conundrum. It's very difficult because on the one hand, you have, on the one hand, you have the government, um, that may not be totally ideal which leads people to leaving the country. And then because people are leaving the country, it's becoming even worse. And then more people want to leave. And then, um, yeah, that's actually the reason why I decided that I'm going to move back this August because someone's got to, someone's got to go back. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah, you have to go back, but you have to have a future. Uh, if they're going to take you yes. back, if they're going to welcome back, after you get educated, uh, you're not going to be a street sweeper. You, you need to have a suitable mm -hmm. position. I am somewhat optimistic that that will be the case when I look at the numbers of new uh, uh, institutions and firms and high-tech uh, institutions that can employ uh, such individuals without their having to leave the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to go back to um, your experience with uh, researching the First Republic and then um, 
how did you feel that after researching the First Republic for so long, how did you feel whenever we finally got our independence again 30 years ago? I, I began to consider trying to study the history of the First Republic because of the controversies relating to it, uh, because I was an idealist that believed in independence. And <clears throat> and then uh, the question is how to study it. Uh, Arme you know, there are a lot of Armenian sources that have particular points of view. Many times they're not based mm -hmm. on uh, firm documentation. And so I spent uh, with my wife, Vartiter, we uh, traveled the world into archives around the world in uh, Great Britain, in France, uh, Germany, Armenia, uh, the ARF archives in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, newspaper archives in Beirut, uh, where um, there is enormous material. It's just hard to... Uh, specify, but we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of bound volumes of documents on these periods. And of course, they are the British perspective, the French perspective, the German perspective, the ARF perspective, maybe. But if you put them all together, you're beginning to get a picture of what was reality. And that reality was not always pretty, of course. Uh, so it took us 30 years to write uh, four volumes on the Republic of Armenia. And I have to joke that the Republic lasted three years, and it took us 30 years to write a history of three years. Um, but in the end, in the end, I think we came up by being as fair and objective as possible with something that could be uh, accepted not only by Armenians, but by non-Armenians. And mm -hmm. I have been told by more than one Georgian scholar, for example, that they are in utter awe, that there is nothing like it uh, in the Georgian uh, world, and that they themselves want to become um, <laughs> the Richard Hovhannessians for Georgia. And they are becoming that, but you know it's a whole generation later, so that you you do leave an impact um, on um, on doing this. Uh, I never uh, tried to disguise my sympathy for independence, um, even the way you, you know historians work <coughs> is not pure science, just the way in which we choose to present the facts in what order already makes you engaged with the subject in a particular way. And yeah. I found myself uh, being honest about the Azerbaijani and the Georgian claims to Karabakh, to Lori, to Borchalu. But why did I, you know, in hindsight, well, I probably knew at the time, I listed their arguments first, and then the Armenian arguments, you know, about coming back. They were all objective. I mean, they're all true. But just mm -hmm. the way we order these things has an effect right. on, uh, on it. And when I um, became aware that Armenia might face the road to independence again, Surprisingly, I was not enthusiastic. Not surprisingly, perhaps. Having been the historian of the First Republic and having seen the experience of the First Republic with the unexpected collapse of the Russian Empire with all its institutions, and it was very much like the Soviet Union in that everything was intertwined. In the Soviet Union, Soviet Armenia could not produce anything without receiving spare parts and raw materials 
from other countries, other Soviet areas. And then it exported to other Soviet countries. It was a sort of a self-contained economy. Well, with, with, in, with independence and with each, each of these countries declaring independence, the economic impact is uh, insurmountable. And we witnessed uh, the total collapse of Armenia's economy. Uh, the winter of 1990-91, people chopping down the trees on Abovian Boulevard, going to bed at 5 o'clock in the afternoon to avoid the freezing cold. I mean, it was misery. And I knew that was going to happen. And my friends in Armenia laughed at me. I thought, you know, you should be the first. Um, and they brought up, I think, certain points like, well, we have Jermuk. We can export Jermuk and this and that. And I said, no, it doesn't work that way. And the reality was that um, we were not prepared for independence, but we had no choice, just as in 1918, there was no choice. Mm -hmm. It was imposed by circumstances. And so in 1991, yeah. there was no other way but to declare independence with all the negative um, consequences. Uh, how do you go from a Soviet economy to a capitalist economy? privatization, um, refugees again, uh, just you know, very difficult. Uh, and, and in a way, then, we do have to give credit to the fact that within a few years, those aspects had become much ameliorated. They hadn't been eliminated but they had become ameliorated. And uh, um, so. Um, just a few more questions, Dr. Alvanishan. Um, what would you say, what, what's, the, what's the core importance of independence? What would you say to someone who says, let Armenia just be under Russian rule so that, oh, you know, we could have our security. What's the importance uh, of uh, having uh, an independent in state? Principle, in principle, I, uh, I'm in conflict because I, I support independence, but I'm also an internationalist. And if we could have a world order, which is, uh, you know, uh, ideal, in which uh, borders don't count and people operate as people, well, I'm all for that. But when they expect me to give up uh, my support of independence while no one else is ready to do that. I find it difficult. But in principle, it would be wonderful to have a, a world order. I mean, that was in part what the League of Nations was supposed to be, the United Nations was supposed to be. But they didn't bear fruit, come to fruition, as they should have. Mm -hmm. Um. In a book called The Armenians, you wrote a chapter titled Genocide, Genocide and Independence, 1914 to 1921. I want to quote from it and then ask a question about this. Uh, I think it's really important. Um, quote, at the turn of the 20th century, the Armenians were experiencing a cultural and political revival. Education had become widespread, even for girls and Armenian intellectuals who had studied in Europe returned home to forge a modern identity for their people. With their homeland divided between the Ottoman and Russian empires, the Armenians were affected by different social, economic, cultural, and political currents, spoke in different dialects, and had different lifestyles. Yet within these contradistinctions, they developed a sense of belonging to a common nationality with a common destiny. How did this common destiny, uh, this common nationality and destiny get forged? They, um, no, people well, were living in different places. Yeah, absolutely. And never was fully achieved yeah. in any case, but uh, the intellectual is intellectual mm -hmm. movement. People um, uh, living in St. Petersburg or Moscow or in Constantinople coming to the concept of a uh, common homeland, uh, facing common problems, uh, and that 
uh, eventually uh, passing on to people like Rafi, who described the oppression of the Armenians in Turkish Armenia and Persian Armenia, and ultimately leading to um, Armenian political parties that are able to um, forward uh, the, that divide of Western and Eastern Armenian, um, never fully, but in part, such as the uh, Armenian Revolutionary Federation, the Hunchagian Party, and others. So they moved from an intellectual awareness to, um, to a political awareness. Uh, and the political awareness also becoming quite aware of other peoples and their struggle for liberation. And so the Armenians looked to the Balkans, they looked to the Macedonians, the Bulgarians, and others, and Greeks, who um, found the, the means of achieving um, liberation. Uh, mm -hmm. Perhaps not taking into proper consideration the fact that all those peoples had European support. European powers intervened on their behalf, whereas in the Armenian case, you didn't have political intervention. You just had pressure, diplomatic <coughs> pressure, and so forth. Um, what I wrote there may be simplified in that up until the very end, I suppose, there were areas that didn't feel that they were a part of anything larger than their local community and local interests. But it did, um, it did develop. And uh, without having gotten there, of course, you would have had no leadership of that first republic. Um, I hope this is a question that no one's ever asked you before. Um, what does love for people, love for country, love for nation mean to you? What does what? What does love for country, love ah. for people, love for nation mean to you? Mm. Well, I suppose we're um, indoctrinated and driven by these concepts that ultimately give us purpose, uh, ultimately give us satisfaction and also pain. Um, give us hope, disappointment. Um, but probably the concept of giving purpose to one's life and uh, using those to achieve higher goals. And uh, I hadn't thought about that, but I would say that's probably what I would say. Okay. Um, that's all my questions, Dr. Hovhannisian. Can you um, recite the poem that you have prepared for us? Well, I really didn't prepare a poem. You asked me to prepare a poem. <laughs> And I'm not a poet, and I don't, <clears throat> you know, people like Vahan Tekeyan and that and that. I suppose the little poems that I selected um, are rather cynical. Uh, um, they may uh, represent a uh, concept about life. One of them were the two-liner by Emily Dickinson, 19th century New England writer who wrote little poetries and put them into cakes and pies that she sent to her neighbors. And the two lines, maybe we should all ask ourselves those two lines, is, um, I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? And finally, finally, I would use Shakespeare. 
and uh, from Macbeth uh, in the death scene, what is life all about? And uh, I'm not sure I entirely agree with this because I contradict myself. But Macbeth said, out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And so as I approach the end of my life, um, I'm not sure I want to believe all of that, but you think you did make some little difference in this earth, but also a great deal of truth to it, and that when we look at all the pettiness within our communities, and petty arguments and divisions, and egos that brings us to it's a tale full of sound and fury signifying nothing in the end right. uh, I need to say this Dr. Ovanishan I think you had an amazing impact on the Armenian community so please uh -huh. don't say that <laughs> thank you so much for uh, uh coming on to the podcast and thank you for Good all the work you. you've done. Oh, thank you.